Welcome to Constellations, the podcast from Kratos. My name is John Gilroy, and I'll be your moderator. Our guest today is Captain Jake Singleton, Air Force Research Laboratory. Captain Singleton has a master's degree in astronautical engineering and has been involved with rapid technology adoption with a focus on investor engagement and increasing cooperation with international government and industry. Much like exchange students, the Air Force has a problem similar to this with their allies. In his role as an exchange officer, Captain Singleton is working with his peers in the United Kingdom. He plays an important role in promoting international cooperation and military research development and acquisition among several NATO countries. Captain Singleton, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself and how you managed to make your way to the UK? Thanks, John, and thanks for having me here today. Uh, I'm excited, yeah, to tell you a little bit about my story, and it is a long story, and I'll, I'll try to keep it succinct, but uh, I am an acquisitions officer, so a developmental engineer by trade, started my education in mechanical, and then proceeded to get a master's in astronautical engineering, and as I came into the Air Force, uh, very excited about uh, figuring out how to deliver these new technologies to people that were at the tip of the spear, to our end users, our operators. And as I started to experience some of the, the challenges inside of program management, I, I learned that there was this gap. And the gap really existed where we started to see emerging commercial space technologies that were coming out of the marketplace, independent of government requirements, uh, and in a community of entrepreneurs and startups, with investors that we didn't traditionally have a good relationship with because of our long processes. And, and I started to see this problem of, you know, there's a lot of risk, not simply in technology development, but simply in how we do business. And we really need to change and transform that a bit. Uh, so I had the opportunity at AFRL to start working uh, in, this, in this area of figuring out how to position ourselves as early adopters for this new community of, of developers in the marketplace um, with accelerator programs, pitch days, things like that. And as I started to invest time and energy into these problems, we started to see some successes. And some of these successes were happening in the international uh, arena, in the marketplace here. And what I realized was the, the marketplace is a global marketplace. And so partnerships and successes here are we're gonna require us to be working with partners in industry outside of our borders. And so I had the opportunity to, to participate in an exchange program or I got to come out here to the UK and work for the UK under this exchange to work on some of these problems. And it was really exactly that, trying to figure out how to take some of the lessons learned, the best practices that we had in the US, some of the unique authorities and things that the UK was doing really well and bring these together to really just scale and multiply the results of what we were doing. Um, so that's really what drove me to, to get out here and under the exchange program that I'm participating in. Uh, I've been out here the last couple of years, you know, with our UK partners, and it's really been an exciting ride with um, some challenges and a lot of successes. So I got to talk about this exchange thing. You know, in a classroom, an exchange student is treated just like all the other students, you know. So I guess an exchange officer. So you're serving the queen right now. Is that right? <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> uh, yeah, that's right. Um, so I'm uh, active duty, you know, Space Force today. Uh, but functionally, day to day, I work with our British partners. I'm tasked and uh, work for, um, you know, our partners. And I, I was riding the bus up to um, the the UK mod site that I work at, and with another DSTL uh, colleague. And one day, he's, you know, he mentioned this phrase. He said, "Live in the dream, serving the Queen." Uh, and I just <laughs> laughed. I'm like, "Oh, I've never heard that." You know, obviously, we wouldn't in America, but it, it's really. It really has been a neat experience to, uh, you know, be working in an environment where I'm not just talking to our international partners, but I'm sitting in the office with them and we're, we're working on and solving problems together. And it's just transformed, you know, the way that I, I look at the world, you know, and how we cooperate together. So is there a parallel in the United States? Is there another exchange officer in Denver or something? Uh, it doesn't always work one-to-one. -one. Um, you know, sometimes it does. The exchange program... You know, it's not swapping personnel all the time, but it's really giving a uh, a process and a framework to send these exchange officers into different countries. Uh, you can imagine, you know, the size of the U.S. Department of Defense. We have a lot of people, a lot more than some of our allies in their offices. So we'll send out a lot of people um, and 
uh, you know, I've met exchange officers from the UK, Australia, and other countries that have come in to work within our labs as well, but it, it's not always one-to-one. -one. Um, we do have uh, exchange agreements under this program with 16 different countries uh, oh. that we do send uh, exchange personnel around and that we can receive them from. Uh, some of them have a little bit of different rules on how we do that, um, but it really is a, a, an exciting program that we have. You know, Captain, one of your efforts is a focus on emerging commercial space technologies that can be matched with the defense needs. So, so what kind of needs or requirements, uh, you know, are the Department of Defense looking for in the commercial sector anyway? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so we, we use this term dual use technologies, and these are technologies that have a clear commercial market as well as you know, they can bring value to that defense mission as well. In different mission areas and technology domains, um, this overlap kind of varies. For space, the overlap is, from my perspective, is, is just nearly right on top of each other. There's not any technologies that the commercial market is putting into orbit, you know, or in support of those space capabilities that can't bring some value to defense. So when you ask me that question on like what technology or mission areas, really, uh, it's, it's just about everything. Uh, and there's so much that's just quickly emerging out of this commercial space market. Um, but what's interesting is that a lot of these companies, they're, they're developing these technologies because there's need in the market. There's an opportunity to make money, right? Um, they don't realize that there are that they have a big you know potential customer within the U.S. Air Force, the Space Force. Um, similarly, there are a lot of our end users or you know procurement officers and folks like that within the Space Force who don't realize what technologies are coming out of the marketplace. And I can give you a, a good example. Uh, one of the first accelerator programs that we piloted back at the beginning of 2017. Uh, there are a handful of companies in there, one of which was developing, you know, it's just a small, you know, couple members of the team. They were looking at uh, developing a constellation of space-based hyperspectral imagers for the oil and gas industry. And they came up to us and they said, the Air Force is here. Are you guys interested in space-based hyperspectral imaging? <laughs> and we just shook our head like, <laughs> yeah, you know, we call it ISR curious what are you guys building it for and they said oh the oil and gas industry because federal regulations say that we need to you know that oil and gas companies need to monitor gas lines for leaks and today you know people are just paying private pilots to fly the gas lines and look out the window and it doesn't really work but they don't have a lot of other options uh, and so there was this kind of realization both from the company as well as from the air force customer on wow like there is huge opportunities here and I'd say from that time in 2017 to now, we've made transformative changes within the Air Force and the Space Force to figure out how to better engage these new companies that are developing these technologies that can bring value to us. And I'd say I really believe um, those opportunities that have been presented have been valuable for defense as well as the companies. I, you know, I talk to companies all the time, and it's never been a better time to work with defense. And the way that we're working together really is health, healthy for both us, for them, their investors, their customers, um, as well as our end users. So, go you ahead. know, Captain, this yeah. uh, this ISR is a real good example of emerging technologies, and and a lot of them are in the marketplace, as you said, just emerging out of needs. Uh, so the question really is 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 how can the government find out about relevant technologies sooner and apply them quicker? I guess you're the lead on that, huh? Yeah. So when we first explored this this challenge, or how do we do this better? Um, what we try not to do is create a government program uh, to try to attract more, more of these companies. What we wanted to do is we wanted to step ourselves outside um, and have us be the one to pivot and to shift to be able to accommodate those relationships a little bit better. Uh, well, we found there's a lot of companies that want and are interested in working with us, but they don't know how. You know, our end user, our, our customer is in a windowless building behind a barbed wire fence. How, where do you start? <laughs> you know, what do you do? Um, so we looked at, um, you know, innovation hubs outside our gates where we can engage companies. We have a front door where companies can come in and talk to us and explore those opportunities. Um, but one of the big ones were these accelerator programs. And you could really they say they, they were already a best practice within industry uh, where companies um, could participate in 
to get what we say is more investment ready. You know, you've got these startups that are trying to close a business model and get to market, raise private capital, you know, establish those customers. And the really the su real successful companies that were emerging and disrupting these markets were coming through these, these VC led accelerator and incubators. They were like a, a business boot camp where companies could get all the support they needed to get to market. And the, the idea that we had was, well, while they're going through this boot camp and getting investment ready, let's partner them with some Air Force, Space Force customers to help them go through this process of beneficiary discovery where they could explore and validate quickly the potential military utility of what they're doing. So now inside of an eight to 10 week period, they're pitching in front of investors and they also have a very clear value proposition for a real military customer and acquisition you know, opportunity. I want to bring up a couple of terms. Now, we have a lot of international listeners, so I'm going to spell this term out that I'm going to speak it like it's an English word almost. It's A-F-W-E-R-X, AFWERKS. And uh, when you started talking about, you know, I, I, well, it sounds like AFWERKS, uh, I guess you're part of that, but I know you're part of AFRL, but is there a difference between AFRL and AFWERKS? And, and just to make it even more confusing, there's now a space works too. So try to explain all those three in 10 seconds, Jay. Can you do that? <laughs> uh, give me 15 seconds. No. <laughs> um, yeah, so AFWERKS was this idea that we could partner, you know, through partnerships, leverage uh, all the innovation that was happening across the Air Force, both with our entrepreneurs inside of the Air Force, as well as connecting those external inv innovators within you know, the commercial marketplace to solve problems. Um, so AFWERKS was a startup of its own within the Department of Defense. It is currently today part of AFRL. So that answers your first question. What's the difference with, between AFRL and AFWERKS? Well, AFWERKS is really an innovation shop um, within AFRL. They focus on a program called Air Force Ventures, which is mm -hmm. using the Small Business Innovation Research Program, you know, America's seed fund, to engage startups in a more transformative, you know, investor-like way. They also have a Spark program where they're fielding solutions to problems from our own airmen and guardians, um, as well as the Prime program that's using um, figuring out how to how do we prime markets and let the commercial market drive, you know, the development in certain sectors, a good example, like flying cars. Um, so SpaceWorks is, uh, as AFWorks kind of grew from its startup to scale up phase, well, we also had the creation of the Space Force as a partment, uh, so as a part of the Department of the Air Force, but its own service. Mm -hmm. So um, the question was, well, should the Space Force independently have its own focus, like a, an AFWERKS program, to gather all the innovation you know, efforts and stakeholders to do something similar. And, and the conclusion was yes. Um, so SpaceWorks, similar to how the Air Force and Space Force has that relationship. Similarly, the SpaceWorks is a part of AFWERKS but independently run to focus on those space innovation activities. You know, Captain, thousands of people from all over the world have listened to this podcast. Go to Google and type in Constellations Podcast to get to our show notes page. Here, you can get transcripts for all 100 plus interviews. Also, you can sign up for free email notifications for future podcasts. I want to focus on, on projects here, maybe get a little more specific here. I know that the AFRL is uh, involved in research and development with many international partners around the world. And uh, they've led away in several projects that are accelerating technology for the United States and our allies. Can you maybe mention a couple of these projects and have they been successful or give us some real world stories, you know? Yeah. Uh, so we have had a rich history of successful, um, you know, collaboration between the U.S. and our international partners for decades. Um, a lot of these programs um, have been focused on research and development within our own research and development facilities like the Air Force Research Lab. In the UK, they have DSTL, which is the Defense Science and Technology Laboratory. Uh, and we have memorandums of agreement or understanding that are built to facilitate cooperation within R&D. Uh, we have uh, one of these MOUs when we were talking about space for uh, called the responsive space capabilities MOU. 
And underneath that, there are what are called project arrangements for specific projects. Uh, one of those is the Microsat Military Utility um, Project Arrangement. And we have another one focused on responsive launch and range. And we use those agreements to co cooperatively you know, look at responsive launch, um, small satellite development, you know, hosted payloads, uh, as well as looking at how do we um, pull data and you know, exploit data sources together. So those are our programs and projects that we've had ongoing for, for some time with a lot of success. Um, what we're currently you know, thinking about more is, you know, as we've seen the technology development landscape around the world shift from being government driven to private sector led, how do we get our international partners like the UK and US and others to cooperate in a similar way? So where our focus is not simply pulling R&D out of our loan labs, but how does the US and the UK together look at partnering with the, the startup community and adopting solutions from the marketplace? And that's really what's been exciting in just the last you know, 12 months um, wow. and what we've been focusing on. I have to uh, bring up our audience again. There's a term used, MOU, and the federal government, everyone tosses it around like baseball or something, but it's a memo of understanding, the MOU. That's, yeah. that's what, what people use. I'd want to, uh, you know, have our audience go, what's that? So type it in, trying to figure what it's all about. Um, in, in researching your background, it looks like you've been closely involved in a London-based accelerator program. It seems real similar to the ones in the United States. You mentioned them before. And I guess the association has been successful. I guess one example is the ISR. Um, have any other ideas been useful for the DOD? Yeah, so one of the, so the accelerator program you're referring to, I believe, is the, the Seraphim Space Camp. So uh, Seraphim, um, is a, Seraphim Capital is a London-based VC that is very prominent in investing in, you know, new startup space ventures around the world. They've had a lot of, you know, very successful companies come out of their portfolio in, um, you know, the last couple of years. Uh, so similar to how I talked about within the Air Force over the last few years, we've been engaging with accelerator programs to figure out how do we, you know, find those dual use opportunities. Um, the UK, in their own independent ventures have been exploring the same things. And one of those was through this partnership with Seraphim. So DSTL, again, that's the Defense Science and Technology Lab. It's the science and technology arm of the Ministry of Defense. And they've been partnering with and participating in the Seraphim Space Camp over the last couple of years. Uh, twice a year, they'll run a cohort of, you know, anywhere between six and 10 companies that are again, getting investment ready, maturing their business models. And, um, DSTL is engaging to really introduce to these companies, here's how you might work with the Ministry of Defense. Here are what some of our needs are. Um, and there are some great examples of companies that have come through there. They've been successful. One of them, you know, we talked about ISR and space-based hyperspectral in the U.S. One of the companies uh, coming through here, which has successfully raised some capital recently, has been looking at a constellation of about 100 kilogram class satellites doing the thermal imaging um, from space as well. And so that's a, a very clear dual use opportunity that the, the Ministry of Defense has been able to explore and look at because of partnering with the Seraphim program. Good, good. I want to maybe take a close look at this uh, DSTL. Um, you know, inevitably, you're learning a lot of lessons over there, interacting with all these different people. Uh, and you're interacting with the, the space program that you talked about earlier, the Defense Science and Technology Laboratory for the UK Ministry of Defense. And that's defense with a C, isn't it? <laughs> that is. That's correct. I have to spell it differently every day. Yeah, you know? yeah. It would drive you crazy. And so, so are, are major differences, minor differences? Is this something minor like a letter and a word or, or are similar concerns, similar goals? Uh, it seems real close, doesn't it? Yeah, very similar. Um, I, I've learned that we have a lot of similar, uh, you know, challenges as we're doing research and development. You know, as you consider how we fund our R&D for defense and using taxpayer public dollars, um, we take very similar approaches to how we run competitions, you know, include things like um, competition to... Um, get good value for the money. And a, a lot of our, our processes are similar. Uh, similarly, you know, we've run into very similar challenges 
Um, I, I, th I thought it was funny coming out here that I hear a lot of our UK partners complain about the same things that we do, um, <laughs> you know, and it's funny because they'll, you know, point at the US and say, oh, you guys probably don't have these problems. You guys have probably figured this out. And I think, no, we have it. We have the same frustrations and we point to you guys thinking like, oh, the UK is doing it better. Um, but what I have found is that um, there are a lot of real ways where we can complement our, our strengths and our weaknesses to really just kind of accelerate the results of what we're doing. And we were able to do that this last year with our, our international pitch day. We, we might talk about that later, but the strategy that we came up with in the end to deliver that program was a strategy that independently, both of our countries couldn't have run alone to reach the same results. So I, I'm a firm believer that aligning these complementary programs in both the countries can allow us to achieve results that we can't you know, individually. Yeah. If you take a look at the DSTL, I think it has a new division called Exploration. Uh, it looks like this division will identify and accelerate transformative technology, systems, and concepts for defense and security. So give us some more insight on this. Do you have something comparable in the United States, or is it just in the UK? Yeah, I think there are a lot of comparable programs. Uh, you know, the Explorations Division, it is just like you described. It's, it's looking forward. It's looking to the future. It's looking at what are these opportunities that maybe don't fit that we should be thinking about that are going to, you know, have big opportunities for impact in the future. You know, whatever in, in organization that you look at in the U.S., they're going to have similar approaches. You know, AFRL just recently did, you know, the S&T 2030 review where they were trying to look at what are the priority technology areas that we should be looking at. So, you know, explorations within DSTL from the concept of looking forward with future into these new opportunities. It's not really a new concept because, you know, other groups with and divisions, they, they're always trying to, to have a future looking vision. Um, for example, within DSTL's space program, they've had, you know, in the past a explorations kind of focus as well. And, and how do we look and receive these kind of new emerging ideas? I think what is important to recognize is the, the emphasis and the priority that DSTL is putting on this today in having a dedicated division within its ranks to focus on exploration and new opportunities. Well, Captain Singleton, I want to pivot here from space to security. And uh, the term that's used, of course, is DevSecOps. So when you think of DevSecOps, are there any suggestions that come to mind in ways that we can improve or facilitate improvements, both internally and with our coalition partners, so that everyone can, you know, share these improvements quickly? Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll be honest, I won't be a, an expert in authority on the DevSecOps. I know, you know, a lot of our our airmen and guardian that are have been involved over the last couple of years of really introducing DevSecOps into how we uh, develop and procure software for the Air Force. It's been very exciting. And it's one of those changes and pivots that I believe is transformative. It is disruptive and it's going to give us that competitive edge in the future. And it really gives me a hope, um, you know, because, you know, sometimes we struggle through using archaic old traditional processes that aren't relevant anymore. And I think the use of DevSecOps with software development is one of those that is allowing us to be relevant as we move into the future. And when you ask that question of, you know, are there opportunities with, as you consider an international and a coalition approach? And I would say yes, absolutely. Um, you know, you could imagine, you know, an environment where the platform and the players that are providing this DevSecOps um, for the U.S. could, through a tech transfer uh, strategy, provide the same support or allow, you know, our U.K. partners to adopt, you know, in a similar way. And I know that, though, you know, we've had conversations and are thinking about those sorts of things. But I guess to answer your question in a, in a simple way, but without being a technical expert or authority in that area, is absolutely yes, um, we should. And I think there are opportunities through tech transfer activities where the UK or other international partners could leverage the same resources, lessons learned um, to introduce, you know, similar processes within their ranks. You know, Captain, I had the pleasure of interviewing uh, Nick Shalan, the Air Force Chief Software Officer. And uh, I think maybe in the interview or after the interview, he said that collaboration with industry is a key to the success of advanced cloud and software efforts. 
So do you think this collaboration with partners here as well as industry is important? And, and I guess really, how do you create an environment where everyone can securely, you know, share these new ideas? That's, that's the challenge, isn't it? It is the challenge. It's an absolute must. Uh, when you think of this strategic competition, you know, around the world with emerging technology uh, and just how the, our operations are changing, right? Um, we have a couple advantages here. Um, against our adversaries. One is just the absolute genius of our American innovators, um, you know, both within and outside of defense. Uh, the spirit of our entrepreneurism and is just unparalleled and it will always give us an advantage if we can harness and partner with those. But beyond that, you know, that genius of our entrepreneurs is our alliances and partnerships they're absolutely necessary and important. And there's something that others don't always have. Um, but I'll give you an example of why this is so important for space today. And you can consider this with, as we're onboarding these critical new solutions, innovations from industry. And that is because when we, when we think about the talent and the solutions coming out of industry, we have to recognize that that is not a US industry today and that a lot of the solutions are emerging out of this international or global marketplace. And we, we often talk about this gap that has developed over the last several decades where all of a sudden, a lot of the funding is coming from non-government sources into this community of entrepreneurs. Uh, but there's a new trend that really has emerged in just the last couple of years. And this is where it's, it's really exciting and it highlights the challenge here. And that is, is about the 2017 timeframe when there was a record number of new investors investing in startup space ventures with record numbers of capital. The majority of these investors were now non-US investors. Ooh. And then when you look just a year later in 2018, that the majority of the deals were going to non-US companies. So you have all of a sudden the last couple of years, record amounts of capital that is now dominated by non-US investors, but the majority of deals going to non-US companies. Now, somebody, you know, folks will say, hey, well, what about SpaceX? There's billions of dollars and this is US, right? Well, while they kind of dominate the headlines, what Seraphim Capital in, in a recent report uh, highlighted is that there are nearly 200 companies from 30, you know, around 30 different countries currently raising capital today for new satellite constellations. And that is, that should be of interest and exciting would, to us. That would to scare some people, I would think, wouldn't it? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So if, so, and I say that because if we fail to recognize uh, that we need a solution and a way to work with allies to adopt solutions from that global marketplace, if we fail to do that, we're missing a lot of of these solutions that are emerging in the market. Yeah. That wasn't yeah, we, a real concern 10 years ago. It is today. It is. It's almost like the ostrich put his head in the sand thinking they have all the answers. There's a lot of stuff going on around them. Yeah. You know, Captain, earlier you mentioned uh, uh, pitch day, and I didn't want to steal your thunder. If you want to expand a little bit on that uh, at the end of the interview here and, and how you handled pitch day over there. Yeah. So I, I, that's a perfect time to mention it. You know, we talked about uh, the environment today with these t trends. There are, you know, technologies emerging independent of government requirements. Again, they're emerging outside of the U.S., around the world. Uh, so we have to ask that question. Do we have a way and ability to, to attract and work with these companies? Um, and International Space Pitch Day was a first pilot and demonstration that we can um, when we work with partners. So what we did for International Space Pitch Day is we took – the lessons learned from these accelerator programs that both the U.S. and U.K. had been engaging with, as well as the model of these pitch day programs. And I can talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, and we took all of that and we scaled it into this global environment. We took challenge areas that were shared by the U.S. and U.K. in combined space operations. We ran an industry accelerator uh, program where companies from around the world could engage with our end users and our stakeholders to learn and understand what these problems were. And if they were interested or had relevant solutions, they could provide a, you know, submit a proposal to participate. 
And we had uh, you know, over 100 suppliers engaged through this process from over 15 countries around the world. Um, we down selected to about 15 countries that, uh, sorry, 15 companies um, from around the world to participate in des some design sprints that we ran that allowed them to really refine and understand through more iterative interactions with those end users what that value proposition was, and then pitch at our international pitch day. And we had a panel of UK and US military space decision makers sit on a panel together. Now, given this was 2020 and in a virtual environment, yeah. uh, we had the companies pitch their, their solution to them. And this panel was able to make uh, decisions uh, after the pitches, um, motivating contract awards that same day. So wow. companies were able to pitch to both US and UK customers together in response to shared challenges in space operations. And we're able to walk away with uh, contracts funded on behalf of both the US Department of Defense and the UK Ministry of Defense. And we had 10 successful companies this year out of the 15 that pitched. And these companies were from the US, UK, as well as India and Australia. Uh, we're, and we're really excited about the solutions there. Um, but I, that was just uh, unprecedented. We had you know, 14 different defense organizations from across the US, UK, and NATO participate. And we awarded on-the-spot contracts to emerging foreign startups from wow. around the world. Wow, I, I love a success story here, really putting innovation in work boots, aren't you? That's great. Yeah, that's great. Well, Captain Singleton, uh, our listeners have learned a lot of lessons about international cooperation to foster innovation. I'd like to thank our guest, Captain Jake Singleton, Air Force Research Laboratory. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the time.